It's good to see so many people here on it. with today. I think it's a little better this morning than it's going to be this evening, but we'll see how things go. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone to please turn off your cell phone or put it on vibrate, as the case might be. Slides. Uh, there they are. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> your introduction. Your first one. Go down there. Go okay. ahead. Go down. 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 Go ahead. Turn again. One more. That one. Go ahead. There. Right there. <laughs> Go to first. Up. Back up. 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 Back up. up. There. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Again, we're not really trying to hide anything, but. Uh, Essentially, the maintenance program is complete. We have a lot of 8.1 computers in there now that you can use. That's good. There you go. That's good. Uh, <clears throat> we have seven, we have machines with Windows 7 on the left side of the room, Windows 8.1 on the right side of the room. We also contributed the machines that we replaced to other uh, uh, charter clubs for their use, and uh, we gave some equipment to CAM itself to upgrade their equipment uh, that they provide to the charter clubs for lectures with use of the uh, Toshiba projector. <coughs> well, that's a little weird. Uh, <coughs> community matters. <coughs> Next board meeting is important. <coughs> January 29th is the annual meeting. We do have to have a, a quorum, so it behooves us to have people turn out. If you do not want to turn out, you can download a proxy form from the website. The next town hall meeting will be in March. Now we've got a number of instances, not a number, several, where people have uh, getting out of the desks in the computer room. Uh, no one has been hurt, fortunately, but we're concerned with this. So we moved the computers to the aisle side, which is in a bigger blocking area to try to avoid this. We've also put signs up. When you're in the lab, please be very cognizant of this. And be very careful, because we really don't want to have anyone uh, getting hurt uh, in, in the lab. 8.1 is download is still a problem. Again, we're, we're working on that. Um, we're not getting any real response that seems to work at this point, but we will keep you informed. Of that. With this, I'd like to introduce Howie Gigo and Howie will talk about the classes for the winter session. Howie will be here in a minute. He's in the back of the room. Oh, he is running. Well, you're the few that are left. Most everybody's gone already. 
and if you didn't get out by tomorrow, you probably won't make it at all. So, um, based on the weather forecast, I, it's been a little difficult getting. Uh, you know, professors, teachers take time off too, and the winter quarter is the time when a lot of our teachers are gone. So we decided originally maybe we shouldn't have any classes. And George said, "No, we got to have classes." Okay. So we're going to have some classes anyway, all right? But anyway, it's, it's a little bit different. And uh, we're going to, I'll just give you a brief explanation of what each class is all about, if it needs it. And uh, the dates will be published. Uh, I had a little trouble putting them together with the things that are changing. And uh, they will be verified on the website shortly. Right, George? All right. Uh, how many of you know what Dropbox is? Okay, the rest of you can attend this then, right? <laughs> Dropbox is a you know free utility. It's kind of like a, it's a cloud application, and you can keep your critical files that you never want to lose or get at from different places. You can keep your stuff using Dropbox. There's there's a myriad of applications of Dropbox, and uh, it was well attended the, the last uh, quarter when we had the fall classes. So we're offering two different sessions for it. So when you see the list, there'll be session one. And then there'll be another date for session two because uh, you only accommodate so many people in the classroom, okay? And if we don't need the second one, then make sure you come to the first one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got that, okay. Uh, <clears throat> home networking basics. How many of you have some kind of network at home? Okay, the rest of you can come to this one. Then. We're going to have a one-night session, class, lecture, if you want. I'm explaining, you know, the terminology for home networking gets to be a little bit different. You know, if you're Comcast, if you're this, if you're wireless, if you're okay, if you've got wireless printers and all kinds of other stuff, and you got tablets running around the house and that. So there's a lot of considerations with putting together a home network. It's not rocket scientists, but on the other hand, if you're not aware of it, uh, you can't take advantage of some things when you go to build your home network. That's what this class will be all about. All right, in the past we've offered a class on um, Microsoft Word and Microsoft um, Excel. This quarter, this session, winter session, we're going to be offering the classes using um, the Open Office from Libra, which is the Microsoft Word lookalike or the Excel lookalike, and we'll be using Libra. Why are we doing that? Because uh, it's one of your favorite words. It's free. <coughs> Okay, and it's free, you just download it and use it. And if, so we're going to be using the Libra versions of uh, Writer and Calc, so you can become familiar with them. The functionality transfers to Word and Excel. So uh, if you're planning on using Libra, or have it in the past, but didn't want to spend the money to, maybe I might look at Excel or I might not, Libra's the way to get involved in it, okay? Take a quick look at it. And this class will get you started, okay? Uh, these classes, by the way, are three sessions each. You can't learn about a word processor in one night or one day. The same thing with Excel, okay? So they are three sessions long when you sign up for those classes. But you'll have quite a, a beginning working knowledge of those products, okay? Intro to the computers using 3.1. This is our basic introduction to computers class. It's going to run for three sessions. It's going to cover everything, you know, um, we're assuming you know what a mouse is. <coughs> How many of you know what a mouse is? Not many. Oh, maybe we've overshot a mark. Okay. <clears throat> uh, basically, beyond that, okay, it'll get you started, and we will be using, like uh, George was mentioning, we will be using Windows 8.1 um, because we have it now, and almost everybody who's going to get a PC in, in the near future is probably going to be with 8 or 8.1. So we'll be using 8.1 as our, our instrument of teaching for that, okay? Okay, I have to push the forward button, right? Down, 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 down. down. The down button. <laughs> the <laughs> other down <laughs> button? Going down. Oh no. No, I gotta go back up one. Don't count these at being the right order. Just read them. <laughs> there it is, file manager. Okay, there we go. Uh, file manager is a class we've offered some time before. It's uh, it takes place on two different days. Basically, it, it covers uh, the tools you need to manage the files on your PC. You know, if you're going to be doing backup or organizing photographs or all, any kind of stuff, you need to know how you move stuff around, how you find stuff, how you can take care of stuff, just keep your closet organized, so to speak. So that's a two, two session. 
cloud application. That's a, a new one, I think. Have we ever offered that one before? I don't think so. We've talked about it here at the monthly meeting. You know, the cloud application or the concept of cloud is been around for a year or two now, but a lot of people still don't understand what that really means. So if we're going to have a, a one class session, which is going to give you some ideas of the power of what the cloud is, and chances are most of you are probably already using one or more of the cloud apps that are available to most of us, okay? I mentioned before Dropbox, that's a cloud application. There's iCloud, there's, uh, there's all kinds of applications, and that's, this, this session, this class, will tend to give you a, a better, fuller understanding of what the cloud applications can do for you and your PC at home. It is a big platform of what's coming in the future, okay? Uh, WordPad tutorial. Okay, WordPad. You don't even have to download WordPad. WordPad is a functional, bare bones essential word processor. And um, it comes with Windows. You don't even have to download it, okay? Um, so we're going to have a, a class on that for WordPad just so you. It has most. You want to just type simple letters and make. That's what WordPad's all about, okay? So that's what we're going to offer that one. Um, okay, here we go into some different things. This is the first time we're going to offer <clears throat> one session, one night, one day, on the Kindle and Surface RT tablets. <coughs> tablets are, seem to be moving to the front of our concern. How many of you own tablets already? Okay, which one of you wants to teach this? <laughs> <laughs> What we're going to be doing is covering, we've break it, broken it apart in, in three basic categories. Can you all hear me? I keep wandering away from this. Yeah. Thing. <clears throat> we're going to have one night that's going to focus on Kindle and the Surface RT, which is what, the Microsoft version? Okay, we'll be doing that. That way you get a feel for it, you'll see it. Now, with these next three, the Kindle, the iPad, and the Android, we're not sure where they're going to be yet because uh, we can't do it in the lab. We need some special gear so we can, our tablets can talk to what's overhead. So we're still working out the details of that. So when you get interested in coming to that, pay attention to what's being offered. Okay, it may be in the game room, it may be somewhere else. That's all I can say right now, all right? By the way, with the way the weather's going, shouldn't we have these sessions down south somewhere? <laughs> okay, so we're offering a session for the Kindle and the Surface. Kindle's really kind of an Android, but it's really different. Surface RT is very different iPad Basics, I haven't got, uh, I haven't snagged the person who's going to be doing the iPad, we'll, um, but I'm talking to what patio tool go. We'll be, we'll be snagging somebody in the near shoe. Won't be Patty. <laughs> well, see, Patty's going to do it, see, so that's, we're all taking care of that. It's also for people, you know, if you're looking for a tablet and you don't know what to do, attend all three and you're going to get immersed in all the different kind of flavors of tablets and then you can make your own decisions, okay? And again, I don't know where it's going to be offered because we have to make sure we've got a projector that can tie into the tablets we're going to be using. Okay. Uh, down, down. No. That's risk management tools. Okay. Um, the last quarter in the fall, we offered a thing called Cliff's Toolbox. Uh, what Cliff was presenting there was a collection of... Uh, hammers and saws and pliers and band-aids that he had collected that he uses in the lab to maintain and take care of your PC. What we're doing here is we're going to focus a little bit more on stuff that you uh, can manage, the, the malware, the viruses, and that. We're going to give you an overview of all the different tools that are available on managing. And why is it risk management? Because when you take care of those things, things against antiviruses and the Trojans and the spiders and all the other crawly things can get on your PC, right? You are really managing or minimizing the risk on your PC. How many of you have ever gone down with a virus or a Trojan horse? You're all lying. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you really need these tools to mitigate all those risks on your PC. That's what this class will be intended at. Now, the last one I've got here is making the transition from Windows 8 to 8.1. Now, how many are on 8 already? How many are on 8.1 8 8 .1 already? Okay. Well, over what George was talking about in the last, over the holidays, what we did is we took, those are all Windows 8, sorry, sir, 
Those are all Windows 8 machine on the side, and they took it right away to Windows 8.1. In getting them to 8.1, plus our other personal experiences, we've come across some interesting facts. So before the rest of you who have 8 or will be buying a machine with 8 on it, you may want to attend this to see what strange things can happen to you as you migrate from 8 to 8.1 and learn from, um, I won't call them our mistakes, our experience. How's that, okay? Because uh, the date for that has to be determined because we just finished installing everything this last couple days. And I want to talk to all the people who were involved in that and put together a collection of what we learned and then so we can present it to you sometime probably in February. We'll announce it on the website, okay? <coughs> or through an email, right? So that's it. Um, I don't have anything else to say, George. Except, would you get a better thing here? I can't use this so we can... Point, I'd like to introduce Ken. And Ken is going to talk as a featured speaker about protecting your computer from a myriad of things that can happen.
Okay, we'll get into protection. Things that, um, that we need to watch out for. Um, and we all know about viruses. Viruses have been around forever. Um, I have a pretty good virus collection, but uh, uh, I'm just starting to update it again. Uh, viruses usually are contagious. They travel from computer to computer. One person gets infected uh, on their computer, and then that talks to other computers and infects other computers. Um, and so it's, it is self-propagating. Malware, it's malicious software, that tends to come in via an email. You have an email attachment, uh, or maybe an email link that you click on, takes you to a, an infected website, and you can infect your computer. Now that usually doesn't spread to other computers, it just infects your computer. Um, we have phishing things that, uh, it's emails that you get that are masquerading as, as uh, all your bank. You get an email that says, um, this is your bank and we've changed our procedures and our security processes and, and we need you to, to log on. Here's the link, you can log on and you need to uh, re-enter all of your, your important information, your social security number or anything. Um, and your, your credit card information, your passwords, and re-enter all this stuff for us. Well, when you click on that link, it's not taking you to your bank, it's taking you to someplace in China or someplace. And, 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 uh, you have to be careful of, of any of those. So if you get an email that says something about, you know, this is your bank and we're changing things, don't click on any links on that. Go call your bank, um, go to the link that you normally use to connect to your bank and click on that, go to your bank and then see if, if that really is true. Um, social engineering, uh, that's obtaining confidential information by deception. A couple of the recent ones are, are um, people will get a phone call and the person on the other end says, uh, this is the McHenry County Courthouse. Um, there's been a, a warrant issued for your arrest because you failed to show up for your jury duty. Um, and, you know, the person very, oh, I didn't, I didn't know about it. And so they say, well, yeah, you, you sound like you're an honest person. Uh, give me your social security number and I can take care of that for you. I can remove that. Well, oh yeah, okay. No. <laughs> Don't give out your social security number when you get solicited like that. Uh, Microsoft too. There's been cases where people have gotten a phone call. Uh, and this is uh, from I'm from Microsoft, and uh, your computer has sent us a message saying that it's got some problems, and for you know fifty nine dollars I can take care of that and fix your problems for you. Just give me your credit card number. And no, uh, you know when you get solicitations like that, never give out any sensitive information, social security number, credit card. Don't even get out your birth date, nothing. Um, just, you have to verify who you're talking to. And if it's a call to you out of the blue, just don't do it. Uh, if you initiated the call to somebody that you know you're talking to, uh, it's probably okay. So these are some of the things that we need to watch out for. Um, now this is something that I talked about, uh, I think last month, is the crypto locker, and some, some call it a virus, although it's just more more malware, but it's pretty bad malware. Um, I'll just review it quickly again. It's, it's ransomware. Uh, what happens is it comes in as an email attachment or you visit an infected website and it installs software on your computer, which then connects to some random servers and uh, asks for a uh, key. It gets a, the, the, the server generates two keys, there's a public and a private key. It sends the public key to your computer, and then the software starts encrypting all of your files, all your pictures, all your documents, all your music, everything that is your stuff on your computer. I don't think it hurts any of the Windows files. So um, when it's done, it's, they're all encrypted, and it puts up a, a screen, I think I have a screenshot of it later, uh, that says uh, you, you, the CryptoLocker virus and pay us $300 in the next 72 hours, or we're going to destroy the other key that you need to unencrypt your files. Um, so, uh, and they say that uh, if you don't pay up in that time, they'll destroy the key, so you will never be able to un unencrypt your files. That's not entirely true. Uh, I found that you can, they, they just escalate the problem. I think it goes up to thousands of dollars then if you don't pay within 72 hours. You pay thousands of dollars and then you can get the other key. Uh, for businesses, 
they usually end up paying up because they need their, their data. The businesses usually have their files backed up though, and that's one of the important things for you to do, back up your files. If you ever get hit with this crypto locker, um, if you've got your files backed up off the computer someplace, not just in another folder, but on a separate device that's not connected. Um, because this crypto locker, it will encrypt anything it can see. If it can see a network drive, it will encrypt it. If it can see your, your backup drive, it will encrypt it. So um, when you back up your stuff, keep it off your computer someplace. Uh, again, law enforcement has been you know, striving to, to defeat this, and so they'll, when they find one of these servers, they'll shut it down. But that just guarantees that your files are gone, because if your files have been encrypted, and they shut down the server that's got the key that you need to unencrypt it, you're dead. So, yeah, they're trying to be helpful, but not, not so helpful. Um, and this is the screen that you see once the program is done encrypting all of your files. And once they're encrypted, they're useless to you. And it's, it's a 2048 bit key, it's a very long key. Um, there is, it would take, I, I forget what I read, it would take 100 years or so to, to unencrypt it with current technology. So, something, and again, these come in via email attachments. You always have to be careful, and I think I, I talked about, oh, well, well, this is another one. Uh, you have to be careful with any uh, attachments to emails that, that you receive, even if it's from a friend. Um, there's a new one now, NeverQuest. And this one is, is interesting in that it captures logins, especially your banking logins. Uh, it, it, it gets on your computer and it'll just sit there and look at web pages you visit. And when it sees something that thinks is a banking login, it records that and eventually it'll send that off to it's home, um, but the software also enables home to take over your computer. And usually in banking, banks have gotten smarter that you log in and it knows, okay, yeah, you're, you're at home and we've talked to you before, but if all of a sudden somebody tried to log in to your bank as you from China, your bank will say, nah, I don't, you've never been like this in China before. We don't think that you have to prove that that's you logging in from China. So that's, that's a safeguard that they've, they've built in. So this software has gotten clever in that it can take over your computer and China can connect to your computer, which can then log into your bank. And your bank says, oh, yeah, you're logging in from home, so it's in your, your secure area, so everything is good. And they can access your accounts and transfer money and write checks, uh, do all, all kinds of things that you would not want them to do. Uh, they, they can also change your bank login password so you can't get in to, to fix anything, but they can empty your bank accounts. And the nasty, nastiest thing about this is this software is for sale and can be used by anyone. There's probably a lot of people in this room that would be capable of using that software. Uh, a lot of the, what they call script kiddies, it's like the, the high school kids and that, that can download and run scripts. They don't know a lot of technology, but they can run scripts. They can buy this software, they can run it, and they can be stealing money from people's accounts. It's called NeverQuest. Um, it doesn't come up and say this is NeverQuest on the, on the file that you would get in your attachment. You just, again, be very wary of any email attachments. Uh, there's a lot of things that I get that I don't even open. Um, and, and I had gotten the crypto locker. I didn't even know it. Um, came in as the, the subject line was ADP payroll. And I thought, well, I don't have anything, to, I don't get paid from any ADP payroll. So I just deleted it. Now I wish I, I wish I would have saved it because then I would have had everything, the whole email and the uh, virus. I do have, that, I have three different versions of the CryptoLocker virus. I do plan to infect one of my computers with it just to see how it works. Um, <laughs> Just to know that after it's done encrypting, if I put other files on there, will it read and will it still work and encrypt those files? Just so that, uh, and, and I'll just build a computer just for that purpose, and then I can just wipe it off afterwards. Now, what can you do? Keep your antivirus up to date. We get people come into the lab with their computers, and they've got uh, Norton Antivirus 2004. And we said, well, haven't you ever up to, well, it, it's still 
runs. Yeah, but it doesn't know about any viruses since 2004. Um, so yeah, it, it, it can do scans every day and make sure that everything since you know, before 2004 is not on your computer, but any of this new stuff, it'll never find. So keep your antivirus up to date. If you're paying for one, if you, if you have Comcast or you have AT&T Comcast, you can get Norton antivirus free from Norton. You log into your Comcast account and just do a search on security, I think, and you can find the, uh, the Norton antivirus from them. If, if you have trouble, you can talk to us in the lab or call Comcast. <coughs> they should be able to help you with that. If you have AT&T, you can get McAfee free. So you can put that on all your computers, and that will help. Not 100% guarantee, but it will, it will help anyway. Um, update malware program definitions. Now in the lab, we use a program called Malwarebytes. Very effective. It's good at removing things that it has found. Um, so um, it's something that you can, uh, malwarebytes.org, I don't think has put it in there. But, um, is the, is the website where you can <coughs> download this. Um, update all software carefully. You'll get things that say, you know, update your Adobe Reader, and then, and then when you go to update it, it's going to want to install Google Chrome, or it's going to want to install some kind of a security scan. Or Read the screens whenever you're updating things. Uh, there may be a little checkbox that you have to uncheck to, so you don't get the McAfee security scan. Um, <clears throat> pay attention to all those screens. Uh, I have this slide, no, something on another slide. Uh, be cautious about opening email attachments, even if it's from someone you know. Um, someone's computer can get infected, and somebody you know, and they send you an email, and, oh, well, that's from so-and-so, I, I, I know them, I can, I can trust them. Uh, not necessarily. They may not even know that email was sent. And you get it, you open it, and now they were infected, now you're infected. So you have to be very, very careful. Um, even email links, there are compromised websites out there that can infect your computer. Uh, how do you protect against that? It's, you just have to use common sense. Uh, there's not much you can do if it's, something's going to take you to a website that's infected. Um, Again, keep all of your, your antivirus and, and everything up to date. <clears throat> and all of your software, your Adobe Reader, your Adobe Flash Player, and, um, Shockwave Flash, all those things that are used by your browser can be taken advantage of by a website. And so visiting a website can open a, a, a PDF file, which if you have an old version of the Adobe Reader, um, it can be compromised and it, it can take over or install some malware on your computer. So try and keep everything up to date. Um, now here's something that I had gotten, and I, I don't remember what website I, I was visiting, but all of a sudden this popped up, and it was something that had some, some video on it. And it says, a flash player update is required to view this content. 100% free update, experience the web to the fullest, and it's recommended download even. Oh, yeah, well, I, I better do that. No. Um, oftentimes, when you, if your browser is set up to display, um, uh, if there's a status bar, and usually it's, it's like down in the bottom corner of your browser window. Uh, if, you, if you hover over a link, you know, it's something that you can click on. And oftentimes, this whole thing is, is a hot link. Anywhere you click on here, even if they had a red X up in the corner there, Sometimes it's not really the real red X that you expect. It's just another part of this whole big image. And you click on that, and it's going to do the same thing as, as that. So again, you get something like this, get out of it anyway. Close your browser, shut down the computer, whatever you have to do, but get away from something like this. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% certain that this was going to infect my computer with something, but it, was, it may just install something that I didn't want in the first place. This is not, and if you notice anywhere around here, it's got the, it's a red thing here with an exclamation mark. Nowhere does it say that it's the Adobe Flash Player. It just says Flash Player. So, um, whoops. This thing keeps coming off. Um, so 
Oh yeah, so anywhere you click on here, you just even see details. It could do the same thing as install. What the words say don't necessarily tell you what it's going to do when you click on it. But like I say, anytime you're on a, on a hot link, if you got the status turned on, it shows you down here where you're going to go. And if it's not going to take you to adobe.com and you think you should, don't click on it. Um, it might be taking you someplace, someplace in Russia that's going to install something else on your computer. Uh, you can check files with an online scan. If you get, if you get an attachment to an email and you'd like to check it to see if it's something that you can open or not safely, uh, there is a website, virustotal.com. You can upload that file to this website and it will run that file through a couple of different uh, security scans and let you know that oh, this one found it has malware, this one found it, didn't find anything wrong with it, and so you get some idea if there's anything wrong with that uh, the file. Another one is uh, ESET.com. ESET makes some antivirus software that's it's pretty good. Um, but for uh, it works okay. It's designed for Internet Explorer. But for Firefox and Chrome, you need to run a small utility program before you can do the upload and the scan. How many people read license agreements when you're installing software? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a reason to do it, to read it. Uh, man finds a thousand dollar prize in EULA. Uh, EULA is end user license agreement. Uh, Doug Heckman was installing a PC pit stop program. He actually read the EULA. In it, he found a clause stating that he could get financial compensation if he emailed his PC pit stop. The result, a one thousand dollar check and proof that people don't read EULAs. Three thousand people before him didn't notice it. The goal of this was to prove that one should read all EULAs so that one can see if an app is spyware if it's buried in the EULA. Um, I never read them. It's, it's, it's impossible to read all that stuff and there's a lot of legalese and stuff in there. Um, but I don't install a lot of weird, you know, I visit a lot of questionable websites. No porn. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I do go to a lot of hacker sites and uh, just kind of hang out in some of the shady corners of the internet. Um, but, but this, um, you know, this guy got a thousand dollar check, which, like I said, it, it, it's, I guess, three thousand people, other people had installed that software, didn't read it, and they could have gotten a thousand dollars, they didn't. This guy got lucky. Um, when you're installing software, always try to go to the, to the software's main site, like Adobe. If it's the Adobe Reader, go to adobe.com. Now, you have to know what the main site is. Uh, doing a Google search doesn't always, or any kind of a Bing search or anything, doesn't always give you the first one in the list isn't always adobe.com. It may be other sites, other download sites that are going to, you, get, you may get the program, but you may get it with a bunch of other software installing as well. Um, don't be tricked into going to something like adobe.downloadstuff.com or something, you know, well, it says Adobe and it says .com, no. Uh, where, you're, where you're going is the domain is downloadstuff.com and the server name is Adobe. Now they can have a bunch of different server names going to one server so they can, they can have all these different company name is going to one server and they can be serving up all kinds of software that is laden with um, malware or just adware. So it would be very annoying. Don't do the express install. That's the easy way around. You know, you want to install something, oh yeah, express. It used to be that the ex express install just avoided things like, okay, where do you want to install the software and do you want it on your desktop? Or, now, when you, when, you don't, when you don't do the Express install, you can see the options like um, they're going to step you through other software. Like, do you want to install this real player? And they don't always use the same words like yes or no, accept or decline. Um, 
approve or deny, and just they, they use different wording. So uh, you have to read the things on the screen. Uh, and, and be careful not to install additional software. So by, by doing the express install, you're, you're agreeing to anything else that they want to install on your computer. You've agreed to it. It's all checked on by default, and it's, it's going to happen. So um, do the custom install. You'll see everyone along the way that's going to say, yeah, do you want to install Real Player? No. Do you want to install Google Chrome? No. Do you want to install this? No. Uh, but you'll have to read it to make sure you click on the right word. Um, passwords. Um, my memory really sucks, Mildred, so I changed my password to incorrect. That way, when I log in with the wrong password, the computer will tell me your password is incorrect. <laughs> Thank you, George, for that one. <laughs> he sent that one to me. Um, yeah, this is not advisable. <laughs> um, there's, there's, I mean, people, people do some really strange things with passwords. Uh, I know, I know one person very well that uses the same password for everything. And that is the worst thing you can do because if one website gets compromised, then they know your, your, the password. They can try that password for other websites that you go to and they can successfully log into other things that you go to. <clears throat> now one of them may be um, relatively harmless, but another one may be online banking. If you use the same password, if they break into this one that's relatively harmless, they can get your password and they can try that. And they might try it on your banking site and discover that, hey, it works here. Uh, not a good idea. So, um, now, passwords are, they're impossible to remember good passwords. Um, so, there's, there's a, a security podcast that I listen to. They, they come up with a new one every week, and it's like an hour and a half long, so I try to keep up with it, but I, I, I can't always. But it's, it's a very good podcast. It's called Security Now. And the guys that do that, they research a lot of the this, this security stuff. And about two years ago, they recommended this last pass. And I had talked about it here once before. And there's probably a lot of people that are afraid to use it. I've been using it for, for a couple of years now. Um, because your, your passwords are stored in the cloud. Uh, sounds very dangerous. <coughs> Your passwords are encrypted on your computer, then they're sent to be stored at LastPass. You have one very secure master password that you have to remember to get into LastPass. Once you do, LastPass is logged in, and then when you go to the websites that you normally visit, LastPass will remember your password and automatically plug it in for you. And you can set LastPass so that it'll time out after 10 minutes, or when you close your browser, it'll, it'll log out so that if you get up and walk away, LastPass will log out, and then somebody else that sits on your computer can't get into all of your stuff. Um, so LastPass, I think, uh, I think I have more, yeah, I have more slides on this. Uh, you can use a local. If you don't feel comfortable putting out in the cloud, there's, there's local password uh, managers that you can put on a flash drive. Or you can put it on your hard drive, too. Um, then it's only stored locally. Now, if somebody hacks into your computer and they, they, they download that from you, well, then they've got all that, too. But still, you have a master password that you have to remember to get into it. So it is uh, somewhat secure. Uh, and I'll talk more about better security for the last pass. Um, don't put your password in your password hint. Um, that's uh, some of the things that I've seen in some of the sites that I go to. Uh, people, in, you know, how when you when you create a password for some place and ask, you know, okay, create a password hint. Well, if your password hint is my password is Chevy Malibu, so when you when you put in the incorrect password, it'll say, oh, here's your password hint. You, you got it wrong. Here's your hint. My password is Chevy. Oh, okay, Chevy. And you type in Chevy Malibu and you get in. Well, that. Password hint is stored in what they call in the clear. 
whatever, whatever server that it's on, it's not encrypted. Your password is encrypted. But that password hint is in plain text. Anybody that sees that server can read your password hint. So if you, if you have your password in there, um, anybody, could, anybody that sees that server can see your password. Um, the other thing that you don't want to do is, is something that, um, well, maybe, maybe your password is Chevy Malibu, and you make your password, and, okay, I'm not going to put that in there. Uh, I'm going to make it uh, the kind of car I drive. Well, you know, I know you, and I know what kind of car you drive, and if, if I try to log in as you, and, and, and it comes up and says, the kind of car I drive, well, I know she drives a Chevy Malibu, so I'll try that. And, and I get in. Uh, you need to make it difficult for people to figure out. You don't want to use your birth date. Um, if you're on Facebook, you know, Facebook tells her, hey, today's my birthday. Uh, so, okay, I got, I got her birthday then. So, um, passwords, you have to be pretty clever with passwords. And I'll give you one hint for, for generating secure passwords. Um, use different passwords on every site that you go to. And people say, that's crazy. I can't do that. There's no way. Um, well, if you, if you start writing them down, you're going to have a, a list. I, I forget how many hundreds of passwords I've got. Um, but I use LastPass, and it keeps track of all of them for me. Uh, never use your banking password on any other site, even on another banking site. If you've got you know, Wells Fargo and Citizen Bank, don't use the same password. If Citizen Bank is hacked and somebody gets your password for that and they find out, oh, he's got a Wells Fargo account too, well, let me try that same password and it works. Hey, <coughs> more money. Uh, so don't use the same password on, on various sites, especially your banking passwords. Use secure passwords, upper and lower case, letters, numbers, special characters. Now, that is pretty crazy looking. But if you create a phrase, like that is you know, this, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Yeah. So it's the first letter of each word, along with a couple of extra characters stuck in there, and some upper and lower case. OK, you have to remember the upper and lower case and where the special characters go. But that's not that difficult. If you, if you emphasize it in your mind, you know, today is the first day Pause. In case they're going to special of the pause, and I'm going to put another character. Rest of your life. Okay. So if you if you get that set in your mind, how do you emphasize the characters that are uppercase? Uh, you can create a password with a phrase like that. And that's not a dictionary word. It's not anything that anybody's going to think of. Or, so um, and that's it. Don't use dictionary words. That's one of the first things hackers do. They have. They have dictionaries on their computers that if they're trying to hack into an account, they'll just run a dictionary against it and try all the dictionary words. So um, don't use anything that's, that's in the dictionary. Now, this is called leet speak. Um, those aren't good passwords either because hackers are the ones that created that and, and, and they know uh, that's, that kind of stuff is in their, in their dictionaries and in their hacking stuff as well. 1337 is a substitution. It's like L E E T. That's why they call it leet speak or elite. Um, so, um, and it would come out something like this the word password would be P at sign instead of the A, SS would be dollar sign, dollar sign, W zero RD. Um, I have seen people that use that. Not a good idea. It's easily hacked. Now here's um, Adobe was hacked, um, and and they got they got my password for Adobe. Uh, me along with the 153, along with 153 million other people. Um, there's a website. Have I been owned? That's a P. Again, that's part of that leak speak stuff. Have I been owned? You can go there and you put in your 
Well, I thought I, I thought I blocked that out. Oh well. Um, <laughs> didn't do a good job. Um, you put in your email address, and it will tell you if your your email address has been associated with an account that's been hacked. Um, this shows there's six websites that are hacked. <coughs> how many accounts are on those six websites? And there's a Stratfor accounts, Gawker accounts, Yahoo accounts, 402,000 Yahoo accounts, Pixel Federation, and Sony accounts. <coughs> so all those those websites have been hacked, and those user IDs and passwords are out. So it's advisable that if you have anything on those, um, change your passwords. Okay, uh, here's more about lastpass.com. It remembers your passwords for you and which website they go to. So you just go to the website and when the login comes up, if you're logged into LastPass, it'll automatically drop in your user ID and your password. And you either have to click on login or it'll automatically do that for you, depending on how you've got it set. Very convenient. Um, it really helps a lot. You don't have to you don't have to remember the passwords, and you can have LastPass generate very secure passwords for you for those sites. Um, passwords can be categorized. You can, well, if you have to look at the list of hundreds of passwords, you can have them in the banking and financial, you can have them in, in, in different categories, so that uh, um, you can find things easier, or even as a search, where you start typing in part of the website name, and it'll show you those, those passwords. Um, and passwords. Mm -hmm. You have to remember one very secure password, like the you know, today's the first day of the rest of your life type thing that gets you logged into LastPass. Then, then you have access to all of your passwords. Your passwords are stored encrypted in the cloud. I've been using it for two years, and <laughs> in the beginning I didn't have my banking passwords in there, and, and now I do. Um, and so far, I'm good. <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I'm a believer in, in LastPass. I think it works very well. Um, it generates one-time use passwords. If you're going to be traveling, this is very nice. You may be using networks that you're not familiar with. You may be using computers that you're not familiar with. You can go into a strange browser and go to the lastpass.com website and log in. And you can have, it, have access to all of your passwords there. But before you leave home, you can generate a list of, say, 10 one-time use passwords. So when you sit down at that computer, you have a printed list, or have it one in the form on your phone, or whatever, um, that, OK, you take the first one, and you log in to LastPass with that. Uh, unless you get into LastPass. Now, as soon as you're logged in, that password will not work again. So cross them off your list. Um, if, if somebody <coughs> sitting nearby intercepted that somehow, they shouldn't be able to, but if they were able to, they, or somebody's looking over your shoulder even, <coughs> they can try and use that password, it won't work. It's already been used. So the next time you sit down, you have to use the next one on the list, and the next one, and the next one. So LastPass will do that. Um, it can automatically fill in forms. It stores your information. You can have your name, address, city, state, zip, phone number, birth date. Um, you could put in your social security number, I don't. Uh, you can put in credit card information. You can put all kinds of things so that when you get to a web page that wants all that name and address information, uh, you can just right click and then last pass, fill in the form. Boom, it populates all those fields for you. Uh, it's very convenient. Uh, again, you've got all your information stored out there in the cloud. Um, it's very annoying. <laughs> I don't know why, what I'm doing wrong with it. But, um, uh, <clears throat> so, and you can have multiple profiles. I can have a couple different ones if I want to fill it in as Ken Zerwinski or Kenneth Zerwinski, or if I want to have, have the phone number available or not available. So I can, use, I can choose between different profiles whenever I'm filling in a form to say, mm, I want it to be Ken Sarwinski for this one. So um, you just click on that one and boom, it populates it with Ken Sarwinski and whatever other information I've filled in in that particular profile. You can create secure notes. Uh, 
and you can store credit card information. Secure notes, you can record things like um, if you have a safe, you can record your safe combination. You can record the, the other other secure information that you don't want to leave written down in, in a desk drawer or something. You can make a, a, a secure note uh, entry in there and enter that information. Um, you can store your credit card information so that when somebody asks for your credit card, um, they can automatically fill that in for you. I don't use that. I do have a PayPal account that I use for buying things online, and that has worked very well. I've been using that for many years. Um, if you're not familiar with PayPal, you give PayPal, very reputable, they've been around for a long time, you give them your credit card information, and when you buy something, as long as they accept PayPal, you just link, they, you click on pay with PayPal, and it links to PayPal, and log into PayPal and say, yes, I approve this payment. PayPal sends the money to the person that you're buying that from. I buy things on eBay, I buy things all over the place with that. Um, nobody ever sees my credit card information. They get money from PayPal. PayPal charges my credit card. Um, if you're not using it, look into it. It's, it's very handy. Uh, you can attach documents to secure notes. When you make that secure note, if you have something you want to scan and, and attach it to there, or have a Word document or something that you have something lengthy that you've written up, you can attach that to a secure note, and that will become secure as well. Now, multi-factor authentication. You can make this even more secure by somebody can't log in unless you've got, uh, my thumb drive is over there. If you've got a flash drive, you put a file on there, and you say, okay, um, you can't log in, even though you have the user, the password, you can't log in unless you've got this flash drive plugged in and it's got this file in it. So not just any flash drive, but it's got to have that particular file on it um, in order to be able to log in. Now that means any time you want to log in, you've got to have that flash drive. It's a little, more, a little less convenient, but um, it's more secure. Um, now, LastPass, using it on your desktop, it's free. I haven't paid them a dime in years. Um, now if you want to use it on your tablet or on your phone, it's a dollar a month, which is very reasonable. So, uh, LastPass, uh, excellent program to use. And here's just, you know, you, you, when you log in, you give it your email address and the master password, and you can tell it to remember your email address so you don't have to type that in every time. And then you just have to put in your master password to get in. Um, you can have it show your, your vault after you log in, which is a list of all of your passwords. You know, normally you don't need to see that, you just want to log in so you can use them. You can have it bring up an on-screen keyboard. If you're on a, on, on a computer that you're not sure, and some computers in little mom and pop hotels, or even, even big hotels, could have a little, uh, what they call a little dongle something in the back that's in line with the keyboard that's or, or software that's capturing your every keystroke. So when you type in your password, you can capture that, that password. Um, bring up the on-screen keyboard, and I have, a, I have a screenshot of that later on. Um, it brings up a keyboard on the bottom of the screen, and with your mouse you move around and click, 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 and you type in your password that way. So you're not actually typing it in through the keyboard. Now, it's possible that that can be compromised too, but it's another step towards better security. Now, LastPass, um, you can have to generate secure passwords, and you can tell it what, how long you want the password to be. That's going to be 12 characters. Um, A to Z, all the capital letters, lowercase letters, numbers. You can have it do special characters. Not all sites will take special characters in the password. so. You can pick and choose what you want to be in the password, and then digit count. I haven't played with that, I don't know. Um, require, require every character type, and then this is the password that's generated. If you don't like that one, you click on generate again, it'll give you a different one. And if you got something you like, you say copy, and then it'll copy it. Uh, the clipboard, you can paste it into whatever website you're generating it for. And then LastPass will automatically, uh, it'll, it'll give you a thing up across the top and say, do you, want to do you want LastPass to remember this for you? And you can say yes. And then LastPass will associate that password with the website that you're at. And next time you go there, it'll just automatically fill it in for you. Um, here's where you can 
can put in your personal information, you can give it a profile name, you know, like I can call one Ken, call one Kenneth, and then the first name would be Ken or Kenneth, and then you want to put in your middle name, last name, fill in as much or as little information as you want, and don't remember that. So when you go to our website, you fill in the form, whatever you put in there, it'll fill in for you. Um, oh, you can also have it require a password reprompt. Anytime you change anything, it, it would come up and ask you, okay, what's your master password? So, again, somebody can't just sit down and change all that stuff on you if you're logged in already. Uh, they would have to put in the master password and get that checked on. Now, here's an on screen keyboard. That's something that's built into Windows. Um, you can go to, oh, I got it up there. Use on screen keyboard for typing passwords. You can find it under now Windows XP 7. Vista, um, start all programs, accessories, and then ease of access. Uh, Windows 8 is different. Uh, if you do Windows 8, you go up and you just forget to walk in the corner and the slider comes up and go down to search and then just type in on screen keyboard and then just click on that and it'll bring up the on screen keyboard. Now with your mouse, you just click, 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 whatever your password is and either hit enter or click enter and it will accept your, whatever you type in. Uh, this is not an appropriate site for that, but uh, you could sign in there with, and then use that. Um, KeyPass. Another program that I was using before LastPass. Again, that's, that's the one that's, one of them that's locally stored. Very good. It, it has a master password like the other. Um, but your stuff is all stored locally. It's still encrypted on your computer or on your flash drive or wherever you tell it to put it. When this password, passwords can be categorized, so you can store them in banking. I have a screenshot here that uh, just general passwords, Windows password, network passwords, you can store one that nobody ever remembers, and that's the password to your router. You get into the router and change the settings in there. You can store that in here, or, or LastPass as well. Um, you know, and the internet passwords, email, home banking. So you can put them in different groups, so that if you're trying to find the password, you Look at internet and then look through those. Um, this this is a, it's a nice program and you can have multiple databases. Um, it's it was handy, but if you start on a flash drive, you have to make sure you have that flash drive with you or you don't have any of your passwords. And then you go, oh, uh, what's that password? I don't know. I have to go find my flash drive. Um, and if you lost the flash drive, it still has a master password though, so somebody would have to know that to get into all of your other passwords. Uh, it, it can also generate passwords. Um, again, you know, uppercase, lowercase, digits, minus character, underlined character, spaces. There's a few more options, brackets. Uh, again, the length of the password, you know, 30 characters, or you can just set it to whatever you want. Um, also include the following characters. Uh, not sure what else there is, but... Anyway, it, it'll, uh, it'll generate a password and, and you can copy that and paste it into whatever you're doing. And I, mm, I didn't even look at the advanced or preview. Um, <clears throat> okay, how many people here are still using Windows XP? Uh, not too many. That's probably good. Um, Windows XP is you know, if you don't know yet, April 8th is the pretty much drop dead date for when, not, I mean, it's not going to stop working, but Microsoft is not going to be supporting it anymore. Uh, so, you should think about being more careful with Windows XP. Um, on XP, Internet Explorer, when, uh, Internet Explorer version 8 is the last version of the browser that will run on Windows XP. Microsoft has come out with Internet Explorer 9, 10, and 11. They've made security fixes, enhancements in, in subsequent versions. You're pretty much left behind if you're still using Internet Explorer ID on XP. You're going to get to the point where if, if you haven't already, there's websites that aren't even going to work with 
version 8 that's one of those internet explorer. So you should change, use Firefox, Chrome, um, there's a couple other browsers. I haven't read anything about Safari in quite some time, but you know, Safari was probably one of the worst ones as far as security goes. Uh, so most people tend to stay with Firefox or Chrome. Now those are being updated all the time. With Windows XP you can still get the latest version of the browser with all the enhancements and security fixes. Uh, <coughs> if you're running Windows XP, keep your antivirus updated. I'm not sure yet what's going to happen if Microsoft is still going to make updates available to the Microsoft Security Essentials on Windows XP. No? Thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> Uh, so, there's, there's a, a very good reason for getting rid of Microsoft Security Essentials if you're running Windows XP. Uh, Microsoft Security Essentials is not one of the best ones anyway, but... Um, um, so, some of the other ones, there's other free ones out there, but again, if you've got Comcast or, or AT&T, you can use, you can get it free from them, you know, Norton or, or um, McAfee, or... There's other ones, um, Bitdefender, ABG, uh, Avira, Antivir. There's a lot of other ones that are free that you can use. They're even better than Microsoft Security Essentials. So, um, you've got some challenges ahead of you if you're going to continue to run Windows XP. Uh, it's a good operating system. I've got computers that run it, and it still runs great. <coughs> you may want to run a Consider something new and eliminate some of the headaches you may run into, but you do need to think about updating a lot of your other software. Um, and always remember, backup, backup, backup. And even if you do that, because of the crypto locker, backup to a, an external hard drive, and keep it offline until you're going to back up again and test your backup before you need it. Um, a backup does you no good if you can't use it. So if you back up your files, try and restore a file just to see that you can do that and you know how to do that so that if you do run into a situation where you need to put files back, you can. Um, and with that, I think I am finished. Can I ask any questions? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Questions. Questions. There's a lot more I could have covered, but <laughs> then there's a limitation on time. <laughs> and the question I have deals with getting your updates. I've been very wary of it. But what I would like maybe for the computer group to do is provide us with the URL that we can key that in so we are at the correct site. You mentioned one, adobe.com for all these other things, so we know we're going to the right place to get the right update and not some of this other fog. Can, can a list like that be compiled? It, it can, um, and we've talked about something like that in, in the computer lab, uh, about even making, you know, downloading it ourselves and having it on the computers in the lab. Uh, I'm not really in favor of that because then if you're at home and you want to update something, you've got to, oh, I can't do that until I, until the lab is open, I can come in and, and get that. Um, having the link would be better, um, assuming that the links don't change and, and, you know, it would work for everybody. But that's, that's probably a, a better way of handling it, linking directly to that site. Um, because, yeah, there are, I've seen where people have done, they'll go into Google and they'll search for Adobe Reader, and Adobe.com is not the first one that comes up. There's four or five others that come up first. And if you go to one of those, you're going to get other other adware, malware, you know, garbage that you don't need. Toolbars. You see people come in here and they have half the screen as toolbars. Do you use these? No, I have no idea where those came from. No, I know how they got there. You just didn't pay attention. Uh, so. When you're installing, always pay attention because you end up with getting toolbars too. So, um, I, I guess the next one's over here. I have a question over here. Um, if you do online shopping, and as an online shopping, you log in as a guest, are there any better protections than um, um, having uh, the storage where it has a, um, no 
know, know your uh, frequent shopper in there. I always log in as a guest. Am I getting any expert protection as logging on as a guest? Because I have to put in all my information newly, all my credit card, my name, everything, every time I do it. Uh, I, it, it, would, it would depend on the website that you're going to, but I, I would guess that once you enter it in there, they've got it. No. So I'm not really getting any extra protection by logging in as a guest. It's false on my part, right? And again, it depends on the website. But many of them, even if you come back as a guest, they, they will remember okay. something about you. They may be stored in a cookie on your computer, maybe stored at their end. Um, so but you recommend that uh, online locker one, whatever, whatever it was called, you recommend using that to, last the last, yeah, last last pass. Pass to, to fill in all that information? That's... I say, I've been using it for a couple of years. But I would um, use it under those circumstances. Well, now, you can do the same thing with, uh, PayPal has all of your information, mm -hmm. and as long as you use that PayPal account, it can fill in your, your address and everything, so. so. So using a PayPal account to say something by Colorado Creek would be uh, a, a reputable online dealer. Mm -hmm. Making my payment through PayPal is better than making my credit card that I'm holding in my hand. Yes. Okay, thank you. Because the more places you spread your credit card number around, the more vulnerable you are. Okay. Look at what happened with Target. <laughs> People are you know, compromising and just use it at Target. Whoa, well, Ken, yeah, but the online Target wasn't compromised. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't say that, but Target no, was but compromised. Make sure everybody understands that because the online Target was not compromised. It's just a strip. Huh? Strip. The credit card strip. Right, just to just the script. Yeah. Okay, next question. Ken, uh, is it correct that the uh, last pass operation is run by the students in Moscow University as a long term project? <laughs> <laughs> or, putting it more directly, who are the people behind last pass and what is their long term plans? I have not investigated that. Um, although, um, the security podcast I listen to, uh, Leo Laporte, and um, his name is escaping me now, uh, the guy who wrote um, some software that we use in, in the lab. Um, um, but he, he this, this, the name that I can't think of, he investigates a lot of the security things, and, and, and he usually goes for things that you can are open source that you can actually look at the code. On this one, I don't know that you can look at the code on it. It's not open source. If I were going to run a long-term scam, this would be ideal to be able to make money one week and sometime in the future would be incredible. Yeah, or you could open a store and start taking credit cards and, and, and you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways you could scam people. With, uh, <laughs> a new project for the club, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, the, the, um, I'm not, I'm not sure who is behind. I haven't investigated last pass, but um, it was just Leo Laporte and, oh, jeez. It's like getting old. Um, I, I can't think of his name, but, um, but the guy is excellent as far as really, really investigating security issues. If you ever listen to um, Security Now, you'll, you'll learn an appreciation for, for this guy that I can't think of his name. And the next one. Site where you have more than one account, more than one user ID, can you still use LastPass? Does it recognize the website? Yes. So it, it, it can come up and you, you can click in there and it'll come up with a drop down. You can select between the different lo uh, user IDs. I and mean, when you click on that one, it'll drop in the right password for that user ID. We can't handle it. Yeah. What if you forget the LastPass password? You're pretty sure you, you're in trouble. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I, I've never done that. Um, there is something there that says forgot your password. I've right. never tried it. Um, but I'm sure there's there's a way that they will communicate with you to you know, via email. And you probably have to have a valid email address there that they can communicate to you with. Okay. Thank you very much, Ken. It's a very good presentation. Okay. Thank everybody for coming today, and uh, look forward to seeing you all next month. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned too, on that Norton security package, 
There is a, a password vault on that that comes with yes. the uh, Comcast uh, package. And it works very well. So. Have a great day.